starting a new series today after um, 27 weeks. We went through the blood covenant, and I was blessed by it, and I'm hoping that, you know, you were equally as blessed, but I'm going to, I'm starting a new series, and it's called Help God, I Want to Change, and this particular title of the first session is going to be, We're Created to Change, Created to Change. Just look at somebody and tell them, you've been created to change. Created to change. Amen. Praise God. Um, see, people in the world, they have an identity crisis. Uh, they run from one thing to another thing trying to find their identity. One fad to another fad. One trend to another trend. One style to another style. One hairdo to another hairdo, right? Trying to find their identity from the outside. And um, they group together in, like cattle. The people of the world, they group together like cattle. And the issue is... Um, is spelled out in the Bible. We see it literally in the Bible, why this all takes place. But the problem is, when you don't, that now, in the day we're living in, they want us, everyone else, to identify with them. And if there's somebody that isn't willing to come into the herd, that come into that identity, they get very aggressive and very angry. Amen? I haven't even seeing that. In fact, this morning, someone was telling me how there was a, um, a school board, um, uh, right? Somebody from the school board uh, that, not here in our town, but they got up and said publicly, if they're not going to go along with what we're wanting, we need to kill them. I mean, outright. They're just, that's it. Just get rid of them. If they wanna, don't want to look like us, be like us, then just kill them. Get, get rid of them. And that's the day we're living in. Uh, it's, it's really a kind of a terrible, terrible time. Uh, but 1 Peter 3, it, it, it tells us, there's more to it, but it, it literally tells us change shouldn't be from the outside. Remember, it says it shouldn't be the way you wear your hair, the way what your clothes you dress in, you know, how good your clothes are. But it should be the, remember the scripture, it should be from the hidden man of the heart. Amen. Because that's incorruptible. Uh, in Romans, the 12th chapter in the second verse says that we're not to be conformed to this world. We're, we are not to be conformed to this world. It's going to be harder and harder in the day we're living in. We're going to have to make stands. But that's where, listen, when we, like just like the word of the Lord this morning, when we find a place in God, we can be who we are and it doesn't really matter. That if, if what people think, it, it, it has no issue, no bearing on, on anything. You know, it's like somebody once said, now if um, I let what uh, you say about me bother me, that means then that I must value your opinion. Exactly. But I don't value your opinion, so it doesn't matter to me. Amen. Right? What we have to value is... God's Word, right? There's where the value for all of our life has to come from. Jesus, His Word. Amen? So, most people want to change, though. I mean, even, it, it, they don't know how. The world doesn't know how. That's why they group together. They're hurting together. Am I on? Okay. They're hurting together. They, You know, it's one fat. Some of these fashions, you ever, you know, see... I remember one year, and this was a long time ago, they were showing all the new fashions over somewhere in Europe, and uh, I thought, oh my lands, I wouldn't, I wouldn't wear that in secret, let alone in public. What are they thinking? I don't have a clue what they're trying to push on people nowadays, but most people want to change. And, and every one of us have areas of our life, we better, especially for Christians, that we're dissatisfied with. Even though, yeah, I'm a new creation in Christ, I, I'm, I'm, you know, in Him, right? We're, we're in Him. But there's, there's areas of my life that I, I have to be growing. I want to be changing. I have to be, I have to be seeing a difference from last year to this year. From 30 years ago to now, there's a lot of times people, Christians are 30 years ago, they're the same people they are now. And they just tell people, if you don't like it, lump it, you know, who cares about you? Well, that's not really the attitude to take. We all need to be needing to change, wanting 
to change because as I'm going to show you this morning, we've been created to be changed. That, that, that's the way we've been created, so that we can be changed. And, the, and, and he did this, obviously knowing that there was going to be a fall and we we're all going to have to change from that corruption. Amen. It, um, David, see, Lord makes a way for change for us. He doesn't leave us in the dark saying, there you are, struggle with it, try to do it. Go get an education, it'll help. No, it doesn't. You know, go see a psychiatrist, it'll help. No, it don't. Go see a doctor, it's going to change you. No, it won't. There, there's only one Way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. And nobody can go to the Father except through Him, the way, Him, the truth, Him, the life. That, that's what we need to hold to. And we're going to see huge changes, especially in the day we're living in right now. It's so accelerated. How many understand and you're saying, wow, boy, time just goes. It, the year is half over now. And it seemed like we just got into this new year, 2021. It's just everything's going so much faster. Well, so then is change. We're going to see change coming such rapid time. But we have to position ourselves for that. David, he was in a, he was in a really difficult position in life. He was attacked on every side. It seemed like enemies were springing up from everywhere. Outside is uh, the kingdom, inside the kingdom, right? And he says this in Psalm 27, 13 through 14. He says, I would have lost heart unless I believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. So he's saying here, the land of the living, by the way, it's, it's now. It's right where you are, right where you're living. Um, actually, the word is uh, translated in some other translations as right here on earth. One is in this present life, and one even translated it before I die. So he said, I would have lost heart unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord right now in my life. Everyone say, right now in my life. The goodness of the Lord is, can change you, help you. But not just change the circumstances, He can change who you are. Amen? And if He changes who you are, the, the, the circumstances don't have to change. Amen? We frustrate ourselves, we spin our wheels, we really lose a lot of time and sleep and, and heartache by wanting circumstances to change. Rather than just saying, hear my Lord, look no further. Remember, we used to sing a song, change me on the inside, change me on the inside, change me on the inside. Uh, Stuart Hamlin wrote one of, in one of his songs, I know not what the future holds, but I know he holds the future. Well, that means if Jesus is your Savior and Lord, just as David was saying here, uh, the future is, is yours. It's nothing to be afraid of. You don't have to be afraid of the future. The Lord holds the future. He's the one that is going to increase you, prosper you, bless you. He's going to lift you up above all the beggarly elements of this world. He's going to change the beggarly elements of the world. In fact, they're getting worse and worse and worse. Amen? What he's gonna, and now, though, even Christians, oh, we, the, the system got to change. It isn't going to, guys. What has to change is us. I can only change me. I can't change you. You have to be the one that says, I'll, 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 I'll accept change. I'll accept to be changed. Amen. And, and so, you know me. We're going to start out this message then. Where do we normally go? Look at Genesis, right? And in the first chapter in Genesis, it says this. Um... Uh, the 31st verse. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So we see that when God created, here it was uh, uh, at the end of the creation, the end of the sixth day, he saw that it was very good. It's a little bit different than what things are today. Right? Very good. I'm thinking of this, you know, uh, in depth just for a while but the Lord's been 
you know, given me this message actually about two years ago, and, and, and I've been compiling and meditating and looking and, and, and grasping the revelation that's needed for my life, and I'm just passing it on to you. But what we see in this world of nature even, we can say, wow, look at how great God is. You look at the sunsets, you look at the sunrises, you look at the flowers and the birds, especially this time of year, right? We're in God's country up here. We say, wow, is God good. This is nothing. Can you imagine what it was after that sixth day? It was very good. God said it was very good. Well, he completed all creation, all the work of his hands, right? And let's look in Genesis 2, 1 through 3. Again, another important scripture. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day. What did he do on the seventh day? From all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. Isn't that good news? I mean, look at this. But I want to note one thing for you. Look at this one thing. The seventh day didn't have the evening and the morning work. The first day, the evening and the morning were the first day. And the evening and the morning were the second day. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day, and the fifth day, and the sixth day. But on the seventh day, very important. Why wouldn't God say in the seventh day, the evening and morning, and there's where he rested? Because there's no beginning with God's rest, no end. There's something eternal to it. And that's what he wants us to enter into, doesn't he? But there was a problem. Adam and Eve sins, right? They, they sinned. And it disrupted God's rest. He just finished all his work. And then right away here, we see that corruption comes in. And the whole earth was, became corrupt. The earth curse system was established. And all of a sudden, in fact, let's look at it. Genesis 6, 9 through 12. Look for, on the cross, Jesus said it's finished, remember? But it says in Genesis 1, 2, 1 through 3 here that he rested from all his work. Why did Jesus have to say it's finished on the cross? If he entered into a rest on the seventh day because corruption came in and he had to start working again. Genesis 6, 9 through 12. It says, this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God and Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Jephthah. The earth also was corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. In fact, corruption spread through everything. In the world, everything is corrupted. Can you imagine what it was like before sin? It was, God said it was very good. Wow. We look at it now thinking, man, it's so great. We look at, the, you know, the Niagara Falls or the, you know, what else do we got here? The Grand Canyon, the, you know, we, we just, we look at the moon and the stars and we say, wow, but it's not as good as it used to be. It's not as wonderful as it was when it, before Adam sinned. Just think, God worked for six days and then rested then he had to work again for 6,000 years and then entered into rest. Why? It took every, he created everything in six days. And now for 6,000 years? We see, I, I have it here somewhere, I think. 
It's in Peter anyway. It says how a, a, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. And here he is. Adam and Eve sinned and so he had to start working all over again. What work? The work of redemption of not just mankind, of all of creation. He had to redeem it all now. Can you imagine? He enters into rest. Man, look at all that was, look at how great it is. And then sin came in and he goes, come on, guys. I'm not going to do this all over again. I'm not going to go back to work. Why did it take with six days to create everything but 6,000 years in order to redeem it. Because it's not God's will that one man perish. Not will, his will that one man perish. And he continually had to do whatever he could do to gain man's attention to come to him where his life could be changed. Amen? Only in the presence of God can our lives be changed. Not in front of a TV. Not watching, uh, you know, a uh, sci-fi movies or horror movies or not watching uh, anything. Just God. Not getting lost in the things of this world. It says this. By the way, it says the earth also was corrupt before God. That means the whole earth, Eretz in the Hebrew. It, it means the, the world, the globe, the, the whole planet was became corrupted. That's why all of creation, right? Romans, I'm getting ahead of myself, or I'll sow some seeds. It, all of creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. All of creation is waiting. We're the ones that, that, that matter to God so much that when we finally decide, whatever it takes, God, I'm changing and allowing him then to manifest in this world through me, then all of creation will also then enter into that rest. Amen. We're told in Hebrews, what is it, the fourth chapter, he, he says this, he, 11th verse, he says, let us therefore labor to enter into that rest. That's where a lot of Christians make a mistake. They get born again. They say, that's it. I have nothing else to do. No more work. Well, then that would have been the same way for God. But he didn't. He entered into rest and had to start working all over again for redemption purposes. That's me. I get born again and by grace I'm saved. You're saved by grace through faith, right? And, and you enter into the family of God, but now you have to labor to enter into that rest. The word corrupt, by the way, Shekaf in Hebrew, it's, it's, uh, it's really a very primitive Hebrew word, and it means to decay, to ruin, literally or figuratively. And it, it's translated by the King James Version of the Bible with the word batter, to smash, you know, batter, cast off, corrupt or corrupter, destroy or destroyer, to lose. To mar. I don't want to lose no more. Do you? To mar. To, to blemish. To perish. To spill. To spoil. Or a spoiler. And to waste. Or a waster. Corrupt. See, iron, it rusts because of oxidization. Oxidization is when uh, oxygen molecules and iron molecules bond. They have an atomic bond their atoms bond together. And because of that, over time, the oxygen, because it's able to bond with that iron, it causes a breakdown called oxide or rust. That's what happened in the world. That's why God says, the tree of, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. If you do, you're going to die and die. Two deaths. 
physically and then spiritually first and then physically took 930 years for Adam to finally pass because of this oxidization of corruption in the world. If the earth wasn't corrupted, we wouldn't, we wouldn't die physically. And there's coming a time when we won't die physically, right? This corruptible will put on incorruption. In other words, the, there will not be the effect of sin any longer. There won't be the effect of this corrupted world any longer in our lives. But Jesus did a work to redeem us unto God. And now we have a work. We are to labor to enter into that rest. Amen? All people have become corrupted. I'm going to share Old Testament scripture and New Testament scripture. Psalms 14, 1 through 3. It says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are what? They're corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have together become what? Corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. Now look at Romans 3, 9 through 18. How many did, does good? None. Zero. We, we all coming into this world means instant corruption. This world is corrupted. Now it might take your car 40 years to rust out. Nowadays probably about four. But you know, 40 years to rust out. But immediately it rolls off that assembly line. There's an oxidization process. Immediately. And you don't see it right away. It looks sparkly. It looks nice. But that process is already in play. Immediately. And then after a while, pretty soon you'll see a little bubble on your paint. You wonder, oh man, my paint's chipping. No, it isn't the paint. It's the oxidization of the metal in this corrupted world that's behind this paint. That's why clothing, well, oh my, my clothes, i got to get new clothes to be in style. So everyone will think I look good. But how many are good? None. It's not the, our way we wear our hair, the Bible says. It's not the clothes we wear. It's the hidden man of the heart that God wants to take and allow to bring forth that which is eternal, incorruptible, into this corrupted life. There's where miracles come from. That's why people can get up out of wheelchairs and blind eyes open and deaf ears hear. Because somebody says, we're going to reach into that eternal realm, the incorruptible, and we're going to bring it to you. And it won't be a transformation by psychological means, by physical means, by what you wear, how, what you look like. It's going to be a transformation that comes by a supernatural means of incorruption. Amen? Amen. Look at it in Romans 3, 9 through 18. It says this, what then? Are we better than they? You know, Paul's saying, well, we're, now we're born again. Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they were all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. How many? All. Oh. They have altogether become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. Their tongue, and with their tongue, they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Though whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness, their feet practice, or their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. Are we seeing that in the day we're living in? It's like that school board member said, we need to kill everyone that opposes us. I mean, come on. This is talking about that. They're probably wonderful folks, you know, for their neighbors or their friends, their, their relatives, their, their children. Everyone thinks, wow, they're great people. But because of corruption, they have to. They can't, they can't avoid showing rust anymore. Paint isn't doing it. 
A new paint job isn't going to get it done. I remember I had a car that I, I, I uh, had somebody paint for me, and um, it was going to be, he said, I can do it cheaper than anyone. He says, bring it here. And it was a classic, and, and then there was some rust that was coming out on it. Well, he sanded it all down, and he, you know, he started off, and he did a paint job, and it was really, it was a very, very good paint job. It was about five months later, it looked like there was rust showing through the, the paint. There was more rust than actually there was before he did it. Because he stripped everything off the metal and he didn't seal it. And it became worse than it was before. That's, that's human effort. That's human effort. And it just seems for a time, oh, look at this. Here, look at it. I mean, people are broke and they have all kinds of debt. And they get a little bit of money and they're, oh, good, look at there. We're just free now. And three months later, they're worse off than what they were before. Because the way of the world is corrupted. And it can't produce anything else. He says, destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. Look at, read the last verse, 18, read out loud. There is no fear of God before their eyes. You know, if we were put to take two little kids, say two little nine-year-old kids, we put them out on the desert island somewhere by themselves, and just hypothetically, nobody's saying to do that, and, um, but if we would, and we, they had provision there to maintain a life. You know, we give them enough provision, but they're the only ones on the island. There's no animals that would, could kill them and even no bugs there. Just, you know, nothing to cause their life to get sick and die prematurely. And um, naturally, they would produce a society, wouldn't they? But that society in itself because it would, it would be, it's birthed into corruption, what would it produce? Corruption. Unless there's a divine intervention of God into their lives, into that society, they would end up biting and devouring one another. They'd end up destroying each other. And we're seeing it huge in the world today, not just the United States. What we're seeing in the United States has been going on. I've been telling you about that for 30 years in other countries. It's just our news media doesn't want anyone to know. They want to think, everyone to think that the United States is the worst place in the world. But it isn't. It's the same as anywhere. It's corrupt. Now, being established on Christian principles, it, seemed, it had more of a longevity. It looked better longer. It produced more longer. But it isn't doing that anymore, is it? Let's look at Genesis 1-1. Praise the Lord. Finally getting there. Read this out loud with me. It says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You ever you heard that statement like God doesn't create junk, right? How about the, in, in James it says every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from heaven from the Father of lights with whom there's no variableness, neither a shadow of turning. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from heaven. Only good and perfect come. He created the heavens and the earth and it was good and perfect. The word here, by the way, for earth is Eretz. Meaning the globe, the, 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 it means, um, uh, I think I got a, one here. Um, yeah, the, the, all the earth, the world, the whole thing. And in the creation story, it's mentioned, you know, many, many times. But all of a sudden in verse 25, we see something different. And that's going to pertain to us, so we need to have ears for this. Genesis 1.25, read it with me. And God made the beasts of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. So there's two words, earth, here. But the first one is eris, meaning the, the, the globe, the ground, the whole sphere. The next word, earth, though, it, it's, the, it's the Hebrew word, Adama. 
not Eretz. Adama. And Adama means the soil. It means, it means the soil or it means red, ruddy. It means the ground, what we walk on, you know, the, or the dirt. That's why in the, in the you know, late 1700s, early 1800s, men are going west, even all through the 1800s, right? The families are moving west, they're wanting to farm, they're wanting to find farmland to plant. Everyone just didn't go for gold, that wasn't until 18, what, 76 or something, right, 76? So, um, uh, the, they would go out there and they were looking for fertile soil, weren't they? It had to be red and loamy. It, it had to, they had to, they smelled it, they looked at it. It had to have nutrients to grow. John would know, man, this is a good soil. Look at, fertile for growth. They wouldn't stop somewhere when it's just sand and silt. They, they wouldn't stop somewhere when there wasn't any nutrients in it, nothing to produce with, right? They were looking for the good soil, the best soil. That's that word here, Adama. Look at it in Genesis 1.26. And let, let's, let's compare now an, another word. It says this, And God said, read it, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So we have authority over all creeps. But... He says, let's make man. You know, the word for man is Adam. The word for earth, the soil here, we, we, Eretz, for the globe, the world, the earth. But for the ground, the earth, the soil, it's Adama, A-D-A-M-A-H. The root of that word for soil is Adam, man. A-D-A-M. The word, there's no vowels in Hebrew, by the way. And so it'd be uh, A-D-M-H or A-D-M. And so you, they put the vowels in because to, in English to, to express the meaning for us. And so A-D-O-M means red. And so that's why A-D-M is earth, soil, Red and man, amen. So it, it, it's 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 needed to understand this. What is he saying? He created man from the soil, didn't he? From the soil, from the dirt, from the soil. Adam. He first created Adama. But the root was there. So he took man from the soil of the earth. And it's so important. He didn't take us from the Eretz, from the, from the earth, the globe. He took us from the soil of the earth. Not the rock of the earth, or the water of the earth, from the soil of the earth. God created mankind, in other words, as fertile soil. And that's what he's telling us. You've been created as fertile soil. Now, if he didn't do this, and man sinned, and corruption came in the world, would we be able to change from that corruption? No, we'd be hopeless. In fact, the Bible says that people in the world without God are hopeless. They're hopeless. They're bound in corruption. They first have to change before they can have hope. Amen. You have all the hope in the world. You have all the hope that God has. There's nothing that He wants to withhold from you. Nothing He doesn't want to do for you. There's nothing. He wants to bless you, help you, increase you, empower you, prosper you, elevate you. He wants you to succeed. He wants you to run farther and faster. He wants you to do more exploits. Amen. Those that know the Lord will be strong and do great exploits. And you're, we're capable of it because we've been made fertile soil. Now here's the deal. We have to choose. Are we going to be as animal 
hurting on the ground? Or are we going to be ones who are willing to sow seed in to the ground? There's the choice. Animal life, nephesh in the Hebrew, meaning just going here and there, to and fro. When I was raised in, in, in Upper Michigan, they had a, a, a town, a city park in Iron Mountain. And once in a while, you know, as kids, we'd go there, I guess, on a field trip with school maybe. Or uh, I was out in the country, so I didn't get into the town very often. But they had a bear, and it, it was in a cage. And it had sort of an underground cement and bunker thing. And, and um, it had a, a cement ledge on it. And uh, it went through a tunnel into another area, and, and it seemed large as a little kid, but boy, I felt sorry for that bear as I grew up. And, and, uh, but all day, that bear would just walk in fo back and forth on that ledge, and it would go to and fro. It would walk here, and it would walk here, and it would walk here, and it would walk here. And that was it. It walked back and forth on that cement ledge so much, it wore it out and it was indented. Cement. That's the world. They're like a bear. Nephesh, that's animal life. That's the word for a man's soul without God. That's why David said, why are you downcast, O my soul? You put your hope in God. You change. You allow God to bring change into you. You don't have to be down. You don't have to be sullen. You don't have to be recluse. You don't have to think that way. You don't have to feel everyone's against you and at you. And you don't have to think that, that the whole world is just against. It's you against the world. That's what the world thinks. That's why I'm so tired of fighting. Just kill them and get rid of them. That's what they did to Jesus, didn't they? I'm so tired of that. Here he is, incorruptible in the world. Let's just get rid of him. That'll, that'll fix it for us. But it didn't fix it for him. It fixed them. They put him in a fix. Corruption came and brought about, about such sorrow in their lives. Now they had to start lying and cheating more than they ever did in order to try to cover what they did. Just like little children. Know they're doing wrong. And when they feel they're going to get found out, let's figure out some way to cover what we do. And they go from bad to worse. That's why Jesus says in the last day, listen, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. You're, you're no different. They're going to want to kill you. This is the day we're living in this time where corruption and incorruption are not coexisting any longer. Something has to go. Something has to take place. And God has a plan. Aren't you glad? God has a plan. He makes a way where there is no way. He fixed it all now. He did the work. Our responsibility is to enter into that rest. Amen. Look at him in, in Acts. Let me, let me, before we go there, it's, it's like this. It's a, it, take a patch of soil. Say if there was a vacant lot, maybe the size of this, you know, auditorium. And it was just, it was between two buildings, and it was sort of an eyesore in the town because there was brush growing up, and there was weeds growing over, and people were throwing garbage in it. It looked terrible. It looked terrible. Does it mean that it's going to be that way all the time? Because it's soil, it can be changed, can it? We can go there, maybe all of us say, let's go and fix that place up. And you see that in cities, they started doing that, right? Let's go fix that place up. And so we pull out all this weeds and we clean up all the junk and we, we, we till up the soil and we plant seeds in it and we start growing vegetables for neighborhoods. 
And we start growing things that are good for people. See, that's what man has been made like. We've been created for change. Animals can't change. They just always got to do what they do. They are what they are. Plants, trees, they don't change. The outward appearance might be changing, but inside it's always the same, right? There's never any difference. Not with man. Not with man. Soil, that inside, can be changed. You can fertilize that soil, can't you? You can water that soil. You can plant good seeds in that soil and it can produce great things, can it? It can, tell, it can bring a future to a lot of people. It can, it can have a different future itself, right? And bring a different future to a lot of people. That's how God created you and me. In Acts 2, we, we have a, we have a, we have a, and a, either we, we have a choice. We can either crouch in the soil like an animal. Let's just lay there. Because we can't change nothing anyway. But we can work the soil. That's why when Jesus came, he said, the kingdom of heaven is if a man would sow seeds in the, on the ground. That's about the whole deal about the kingdom of heaven. So remember, some fell on a hard path and didn't produce nothing, and some fell on rocks and just produced for a little bit, no root. Ended up dying in the heat of the sun. Some fell on thistles and thorns, uh, and it, it, it choked it out. But there was some seeds that went into good soil. The ones that said, here, God, here's my heart, here's my life. I want to be changed. Take out what needs to be taken out. Let's work at this. Let's, let's work together here, God. And that person will produce some 100, some 60, and some or some, and 30 fold. But we will be producing. Amen? Everyone say, I want to produce in this life. Not just, oh God, get me out of here. I'm tired of the circumstances. Just get me to heaven. No, I want to produce here. And we're going to see through Jeremiah and Isaiah in, 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 in some studies to come. That's exactly what God was, is asking of us. Not to get out of here. He put us here. He wants us here to produce for Him. Amen? Acts 2, 22 through 23. Here's the day of Pentecost, right? They were. It was 10 days after uh, Jesus uh, left the earth and 50 days after His uh, uh, crucifixion. And so we see that... Um, we see that... Uh, there was some strange things taking place. The Holy Spirit was poured out, and, and he preaches. He's, he's here, here speaking, and he's preaching. And it's very important what he says about all what I've been talking about. It says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourself also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For um, whom uh, David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will, what? Rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in hell, or Hades. You will not allow your Holy One to see, what? Corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You, have, you will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of this patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on the throne... He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul is not left in Hades. 
nor did his flesh, what? See corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses, therefore being exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. He became exalted to the right hand of the Father, right? And he poured out the Holy Spirit. He entered into the Sabbath again, that day of rest. Six days he created. Adam gives it all up, hands it over, all corruption comes in, so he has to start working again. And 6,000 years he worked until on the cross he yelled out, It is finished! And then he was raised from the dead and he's seated at the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. The spirit of incorruption. And it was poured out then to those that would believe in Jesus Christ. That we could, we could live in a way that would supersede the beggarly elements of this world. Another seed here, just for not this message, but just another seed. Jesus, when um, when there when there was uh, five thousand people, and he just had a, um, a loaf, a couple of loaves of bread, and a few fish. Um, what did he do? Did he go to the store to buy enough food for them? That was the predicament that the disciples said. There's where their minds immediately went. What did he do? He just blessed what he had, and incorruption came and multiplied it and fed everyone, and they had left over more than what they started with. Amen? Today our minds want to continually go to that corrupted element, this, this earth curse system. Trying to figure out how can we get by? How can we do this? If God said it, do it. A handful of people in Merrill, Wisconsin. You know what? Uh, almost a 40,000 square foot facility with radio and school and daycare and college and church. And how are we going to do this with feeding programs? And not just here in 37 nations now. We didn't have to say, how are we going to do this? Just, just whatever God tells us to do, do it. At the, at the wedding of Canaan, Galilee, and, uh, when, when they ran out of wine, and Mary came and said, they just come to me and said they ran out of wine, Jesus. Did he say, well, man, go to the store. Get to the vineyard. We got to do something here. No. He said, just get water pots of water, and, and he ends up making, what, 96 gallons of wine. And the, the, the master of the wedding, he tasted it and said, this is wrong. What's, what's with you guys? I've never seen people like you. Usually people give the best wine first. When people get a little tipsy, you give them the junk, and they can't tell the difference. But you gave the worst wine first, and now you left the best for last. This is incredible wine. How did he do that? Was there some kind, did he do any natural means, any natural way? This is where God wants you to live. This is where God wants you to be. Living from an incorruptible realm, bringing in what he has provided and worked for and died for. We're in a time when this system isn't going to work anymore for us. We're going to be forced to believe, I'd rather do it now and save a lot of nights without sleep. I'll, I'll sleep right through them because I, I, I've seen God do it before I know it. This is where I've entered in. This is what He does. The day of the Lord is a, a thousand years is as a day, and a day is as a thousand years to God. And the first time He created was six days, and the last time He had to work, it lasted six thousand years. And then when He went to heaven, He says, now I'm going to prepare a place for you. 
Wow! Can you imagine how that's going to be? What we see in the world, the flowers, the birds, the trees, I'm at awe. God's phenomenal. But it's been corrupted. It isn't His very good work anymore. It's been corrupted. There's only one that became His very good work again. And that's on everyone that's called on the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Look at this in 1 Peter 1, 23. It says, having, read it, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Incorruptible. We're born again of an incorruptible seed. We've been incorruptible seed. Life has been brought into us. That's what we're to live out of. Not the corruptible, but the incorruptible. Doesn't mean you don't get a job. You know, it's like the guy that's leaning on a shovel and praying that God make him a hole. You got a shovel dig. There is part that we do. We're in this world, and we're going to get into that. Book of Isaiah, book of Jeremiah, we're going to see how God tells us we're supposed to go out here and work and make the world a better place for them. It's their place, not mine, not yours. We're just sojourning through here. But I'm supposed to be making it better for them. You're supposed to be making it better for them. That's why of all the Nobel Prize winners, the, the majority of them, 90% of them, the majority, all came from Christians or the Jews who had no their covenant with God. Because that's what God's plan is. Let's make the world a better place for them. Not for us. We're going to be taken out of here. Let's hold off corruption all we can for them. Why? It took 6,000 years for Jesus to bring redemption because it's not His will that any perish. Do we just start praying, get us out of here, Jesus. It's getting too bad for me. When we're not even doing our part to make it better. All we're doing is complaining about how it is. That's not our place. That's not our place. Our place is to make a change. We've been given the birthright. To bring incorruptible change. To bring life and life more abundantly. Amen. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Son. Look at James 1.18. I'm going to read out the New Living Translation. I don't know what these other translations were. I'm sorry I should have been saying. But it, it says this. Read it with me. He chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word. So he's not saying he chose to give birth to us into this world. No, that was him too, bringing us into this world. But he's talking about a different birth. The birth that Jesus told Nikki about, right? You can, he says, without you can't even see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. Nick, hey, how can you be born again? I can't enter a second time in my mother's womb. He said, no, you, got, you were born of water in your mother, from your mother's womb, but now you've got to be born of the Spirit. You were born of corruptible. Now you've got to be born of incorruptible. Amen? Read it again. Read it with me. He chose to give birth to us by giving us His true word. And we, out of all creation, became His prized possession. Isn't that incredible? Why are we His prized possession? Just because who we are? No, it's because of how He created us and our, what we're capable of. We're the ones in this earth now that can make a change. We're the ones in this world now that can bring a difference. Amen? We can, we can allow heaven into these people's lives. We can show them the goodness of God in an incorruptible way. Blessing them, feeding them, allowing. Look at, do you really think everything we're doing here is because we, look at, we're taking up a, are you all millionaires? And you're given every week $100,000 in the, in the offering? That's how we can do all this stuff? No. God intervenes. 
We do what he, we're told to do, and then he does his rest. And you, who, who are holding on to that little ten bucks or a hundred dollars, thinking, I'm not giving it away, I need it. You need to pass from death into life. You need to go from living in corruption into walking in a place of, of, of or of, of incorruption. A place where God will start providing, God will start doing for you, Amen. You got to start hearing them and doing it. That's why obedience is so incredible with the Christian. Because it allows the incorruptible to come into this your life and into this world. Somebody that, you know, you ever hear they didn't want to get born again? Why? Well, I don't want to, I don't want to lose my friends. It's all, I, I, I don't, I'm afraid to be away from the herd. I don't want to lose my family. Jesus says, unless you, you know, you uh, uh, lose house and family and wives and mothers and brothers and for my sake, you're not worthy of the kingdom. That's what he was meaning. We got to say, it's not means that we're going to, we're, we're never going to have them. It means I'm leaving the pack mentality, the herd mentality. I'm not an animal in this world. I want to be, have a new life. I'm tired of that. Let's do like they do. Let's be like they do. Let's try to fit in. It's too exhausting. See, it, 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 we have to be people that just aren't able to change. We have to become people who are willing to change. There's a difference. Once you're Christ's, he says, if you're, if you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. If you deny and rebel, you'll be devoured in this corrupted world. Look at with me in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Read it out loud with me. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We're the only creation in the existence that can be changed into something totally different. From corrupted to incorrupted. From corruptible into incorruptible. We can become brand new creations. It's so important that you take hold of this. Because this foundation, when we start building off of it, man, the light's going to start going on in your life, and God's, you're, you're going to start walking with God in a new way and finding blessings abundantly above and beyond all you could ever ask or think. Pam and I, we very, very seldom pray for anything. And within, if we have a need, usually within a day, most, you know, most of the time, once in a while, maybe two, all of a sudden, here it is. It just comes. It's there. That's it. That's why Jesus says, take no thought for your own life, what you'll eat, what you'll wear, what you'll put on, you know, drink. Don't do that. He says... The worry of the day is sufficient. He says, listen, to God provides for nature. He said, look at the lily of the valley. It doesn't toil, it doesn't spin, yet your father takes care of it. Even though today in the morning it's, it's beautiful, by noon it's burned up by the sun. He still takes care of it. How about the birds? They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't heap up in barns. Yet your father takes care of them. How much more are you better than they? Oh, you have little faith. We have to understand we've been created to change. He created us in a way that we can take on not just his image and in his likeness. We, we can take on the very eternity that he is. The timeless element. God. 
Ephesians 2, 4 through 7. Remember when Peter preaching, he says, God raised this Jesus up and we are all witnesses of it. Therefore, he's exalted to the right hand of God. Look at, look at this. In Ephesians 2, 4 through 7, it says, But God was rich in mercy because of his great love wherewith he had loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. In other words, when we were bound in corruption, he's, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And read it. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. When we get born again, he made us sit together with Jesus in heaven. Why? Because there is where through this place of rest, all that God has done can flow. That's why we're to labor to enter into solely. We're to labor to enter into it. That's our work, coming to church, encouraging one another, turning off the, t uh, uh, the, the news. You, you don't need it. You know it's bad and it's going to get worse. Why do I have to have a play-by-play -play description? Spend time in the Word. Read your Bible. Get that which is eternal planted into you and what's going to happen, because you were made to be good soil for God, you will start producing what this says. All the promises, all the goodness, all that God is will start becoming you. You. John 8, 31 through 32. Then Jesus said, read it. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciple indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You'll know the truth. See, you can't know the freedom of the truth unless you first know the truth. And to know the truth means you're, you, you, you have revelation of it. It's producing fruit through you. This is what Paul shared this morning. You know, He says that w when we give, he says uh, it will be given back to us, but we will then bear the fruits of righteousness. We'll start bearing the fruit of the righteousness that he's given us. If we start acting out, doing what he said, applying ourselves the way we need. It just doesn't happen. Just, gee, I'm born again, so God got to give me everything now. It's just going to happen. No, you've been made to be soil. And you've got to start planting seed yourself. That's why when Oral Roberts was asked, they said after the healing, you know, all these healing revivals, you know, and the, the time of healing revival with, with uh, A. Allen and, and uh, you know, William Branham and Catherine Kuhlman and, and you know, uh, many others. But um, Oral Roberts was asked, and, and others were, but they said, well, how many really kept their healing after you prayed for them? And they said, it may be an exaggeration, but maybe about 40%. What happened to the other ones? Why'd they lose what God gave them through the man of God or the woman of God? Because every one of us have our own responsibility to plant the seeds into our life. Every one of us. And unless we're willing to take the time to plant the seeds from the Word of God, not just reading it, but doing it then, Applying it, listen to God and do what He tells you to do. You'll not bear the fruit yourself. People can get healed and they still go about watching the, you know, the, the, the scary movies and they keep reading the trash magazines and they keep hanging around with the folks that can't talk, you know, with uh, civil. Uh, with the, use their tongue for anything other than cursing, and they wonder why. Why did my life change? Why did I lose my healing? Why am I back in the same old place that I was? You know, I gave my life to Jesus Christ when I was 11 years old. 
I was close to him. I prayed with him. I heard his voice. We talked. I was just, I was beside myself experiencing newness of life. But then, the very first step, I quit going to church. I quit going to church because I started hanging around some people that didn't. And they had other things to do. And they were seemed more fun. And I started doing that. And my life went on a downward spiral. And you know that a backslidden Christian is, looks nothing different than a, some, uh, somebody in the world. And I ended up becoming a drug addict and an alcoholic. Thinking, what does it matter? It does. That's why when I recommitted my life to Jesus Christ, I started preaching for him. I knew I had to just go for it. I had to do what he told me to do. And I ran, it way I told you before, but I ran, it wasn't from him. It was because I knew there was a call of God on my life and I didn't want to be a pastor. My pastor was an alcoholic. He never helped anybody. You can help a lot of people if you're willing to sow into your life. If you're willing to allow the seed of God's word, the incorruptible seed of the word of God into you. The only way you can get born again is by the incorruptible word. And the only way that you can grow and change and become the person, maybe the, the change that you want, but allowing God to bring the change that he wants. The only way is to keep allowing the incorruptible Word of God into your life. To doing it, living by it. We may not feel that we're, gonna, we're, we're doing things perfect, but at least we're giving it a shot. We're doing what we can, how we know. The only one that was perfect was Jesus Christ. But we just got to apply ourselves as God said to. And we'll start producing fruit pretty soon. It doesn't matter what anyone thinks. Pretty soon, it, oh well, I'm living for Jesus. And all I care about is doing what he wants and producing what he needs. If I lived to please people, I'd no longer be a servant of God. Galatians 1 and 10 says, that's what he wants from every one of you. That's what he needs from you. And I want everyone in here to stand up, and I want everyone listening right now, wherever you are, by radio, on the internet, wherever you are. And now's the time. Today's the day of salvation. Now's the time. What you're saying, you don't want to give up. You're saying, I don't want to leave the herd. I want to still be part of the system that everyone looks alike, is looks acts alike, and, and that's it. We're, I'm just going to just meld in so I don't draw attention, so I just look like them, and that's okay. Then they leave me alone. What would it profit you if you gain the whole world, but you lose your soul? What would you profit? If you're in here today, you, you need to give your life to Jesus Christ. If maybe you've backslidden, you've not, you're, you're not on fire, and maybe you're not robbing banks and you know doing drugs, but you're, you're not on fire with the Spirit of God the way you used to be. You're backslidden. Maybe, maybe your life is just saying, I need, to, I need some change. I don't, I don't like certain areas of my life. I just, I just don't like them. Well, change will come. I won't tell you today, but you know, there are several different areas of my life. And, and one of them took two years. But I looked back then and I thought, that's not me anymore. Praise the Lord. I rejoice, man. I'll tell you what. It was, um, it, it was incredible. And that's what God wants from every one of us. Because only then are we really starting to produce what he needs to, through us for other people. 
So lift up your hands to the Lord. Wherever you are, let's pray. Let's pray right now. Today's the day. Now's the time. Just say, God, forgive me of all my sin. I don't want to sin anymore. I need change in my life. And I know that you're the only one that can change me. Jesus, come into my life. The incorruptible word come deep within my soul and produce eternity in me. In Jesus' mighty name, I give my life to you. I'll live for you. I'm committed to you. And I'm confident because now I'm seated in the heavens with Christ. You will show me all the good things that you have for me. And the abundance of your grace and love for my life. In Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen and Amen. Pray, give the Lord a hand up. Praise the Lord.